Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McCray. Tracy, you know, most of us have experienced it. Oh, my aching back. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like your husband. Yes. Uh-huh. Not too long. Oh, yep. Well, back pain is one of the most common reasons people go to the doctor or a reason that they miss work. And it is a leading cause of disability around the world. Back pain can come on suddenly caused by a fall or heavy lifting. Now, this acute or sudden onset back pain usually goes away with some minor activity restrictions and over-the-counter pain medications. It's usually with a capital U, right? (laughs) Usually. Back pain that lasts more than three months is categorized as chronic, and it may require more extensive treatment, including surgery. Here to discuss minimally invasive spine surgery... That doesn't seem possible. (laughs) And to help bust some back myths is Mayo Clinic neurospine surgeon, Dr. Mohammed Biden. Welcome to the program, Dr. Biden. It is great to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Dr. Biden, good to have you here. So I I actually haven't heard it phrased quite that way before, neurospine surgeon. So you're a neurosurgeon or a brain surgeon who does spine surgery, right? Exactly. Spine surgery is done by two specialties in medicine, neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery, which you know a lot about, Dr. Uh, Shives. Yeah, but I don't know much about the spine, and that's a good thing as far as I'm concerned. (laughs) So uh, I I just have to say, (laughs) how in the world is there such a thing as minimally invasive spine surgery? That doesn't seem possible. Well, it's an emerging field um, that uh, you know has been pioneered uh, by several people, uh, including those here. And uh, the field of minimally invasive spine relies on really a few um, key things. You may have seen commercials for what they call laser spine, for mm-hmm. example. Laser, laser sp- spine surgery, there is such a thing? Well, we don't call it that at Mayo Clinic, and I'll give you the reason. Um, laser spine surgery essentially refers to Uh, minimally invasive spine interventions and procedures. The reason that we don't call it that at Mayo Clinic is that most of the interventions and procedures around spine, even those that are minimally invasive, don't involve lasers, although some do. So it's a little bit of a term of art that uh, some practices, you know, around the country have decided to use. Here we use the term minimally invasive uh, spinal interventions or spine surgery. The interventions are done by our colleagues in radiology, physical medicine and rehab, or anesthesiology. The surgeries are done by neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons. So those are kind of the things, and the basic premise of minimally invasive spine surgery is to avoid muscle crush injury. In a traditional spine surgery, and not everybody's a candidate for minimally invasive, we should emphasize, but in a traditional spine surgery, you you use retractors to take the muscles and move them off of the uh, tendons in the midline bone structures and then you put them back at the end. They never quite come back the same. And it's believed that that's one of the reasons that people have something called adjacent segment disease, where after you address one level of the spine, say L4-5, you then get problems at L3-4, L2-3, L1-2, and you go up and up and up chasing the problems. Minimally invasive spine relies on muscle splitting uh, technologies where either retractors or percutaneous tubes and wires are used. Percutaneous through the skin. Through the skin Mm -hmm. to access the spine and to accomplish either decompressions or stabilizations. All right, uh, decompression. Ah, So uh, decompressions are when the bones or the ligaments overgrow and cause compression of the neural elements, whether that's the nerve roots causing pain down the leg or down the arm, or... Uh, the spinal cord or thecal sac causing either uh, compression of the spinal cord where you have difficulty walking using your hands or compression of the thecal sac in the lumbar spine where you have something called neurogenic claudication, difficulty with uh, walking. So if it's lower down in the, in the back, it's the nerve roots. If it's higher up, it's the cord itself. Exactly. And the, uh, what you try to do uh, from the outside is imp- increase the area, the space, so it takes the pressure off either the cord or the nerve roots. That's precisely right. And okay. you can do it either in a traditional open surgery or in a minimally invasive surgery. In minimally invasive surgery, we rely on one of two things. There's percutaneous and tubular. Tubular means we put a set of tubes, we make an incision off midline to protect the tendons in the middle and to protect the muscles that come into the middle. And we make an incision, and then we put sequential tubular dilators uh, down through the muscle to access the bone to then drill the bone out and close. The incisions can be 18 millimeters, as small as you know, 16, 18 millimeters. How can so you tell? That's like an inch or so. Yeah. Yeah. Inch, yeah. How can you tell if a patient is a candidate for a um, in less invasive type of back surgery? Right. That's a great question. Uh, sometimes the number of 
uh, levels factors in. So patients with uh, disease across many, many levels may not be great candidates, although they may as well. Uh, a lot of it depends on where the pain generators are and how many pain generators there are. So it's very important to do a good diagnostic workup at the beginning, understand what's generating the pain, and then design a plan to tackle that pain generator. And when you say diagnostic workup, what does that normally involve? So the traditional uh, workup that we start with would be imaging, x-rays, and uh, MRI uh, imaging. Uh, rarely CAT scans, maybe in cases where uh, patients can't get MRIs or where patients have had surgery before. So um, in, in general, an MRI is the best imaging test that you have to look at the spine. Absolutely, an spine. MRI. Okay. X-rays are very important, too, because mm -hmm. they show us dynamically when patients stand up what happens to their bones. Um, and then after that, we'd want to do uh, potentially, uh, if the patients needed, a series of uh, you could do injections uh, or EMG tests, nerve conduction tests, to understand exactly where the pain's coming from. Generally, especially in patients of a certain age, a lot of areas in the spine will have degeneration or wear and tear of the spine. And so um, th one of the things that are critical is to identify which of those areas, so that we don't go in and address all the areas, but identify which area is symptomatic. Is that the most common type of back complaint, is the wear and tear age-related type of back issues? Uh, there's uh, two types of, uh, well, there's many types of uh, pain. Uh, one of the types is musculofascial, where you have uh, pain in the muscles, and that generally goes away. You generally, you generally wouldn't even get imaging for that. You'd go see your primary care doctor, he tell you, you know, kind of take an aspirin, call me in the morning. He may give you some physical therapy, things like that. Um, pain that's uh, degenerative, spine pain that's degenerative in nature is resulting from that wear and tear, as you say. Um, and so exactly where uh, with older age, the bones get and the, and the joints get used more and more. They start to wear out, much like our other joints do in or orthopedic uh, in orthopedics. And then um, as a result of that wearing out, they either lose the joint fluid or they start to hypertrophy and grow and cause compression around the elements around them. Yeah, there's a couple of thing that, things that I, I think our listeners uh, would appreciate understanding, and that is you mentioned joint disease. Well, in fact, there are small joints between all the different vertebral bodies. So when you talk about degeneration of the hip or the knee, a similar thing can happen in the back. The cartilage wears out in the joints between the vertebra. And the other thing that degenerates, unfortunately, over time is the disc between the vertebra because it's nice and big and gel-filled and juicy and cushioning when you're young. But as you get older, the thing sort of collapses and degenerates and gets hard. And both of those can cause back pain, right? You're exactly right. Uh, there's at least there's a number of joints at every single spinal level. Yeah. Um, and so there are there's the disc, the intervertebral disc, which is a joint that serves between two vertebral bodies. There's the facet joints, which are two joints in the back that help uh, hold the vertebral bodies together and allow for flexion and extension of our backs. And any of those joints can degenerate. So we started off talking about the commercials that you see on television for that laser surgery. Is there such a thing as that, or are they just calling a surgery a laser surgery to get people interested in it? So the term laser can be thrown before any word. Right. Now we're seeing things like laser rehab, for example, where you, get, you go to rehab and, and they call it laser rehab. Uh, the term laser, as those places are calling it, generally is referring to... Um, you know, minimally invasive procedures or tests. Sometimes that can be a transforaminal epidural steroidal injection. Sometimes that can be a selective nerve root block. Sometimes that can be a nerve ablation. Other times when it refers to surgery, then we get into either decompressions or stabilizations or the kinds of things that we do. So, for example, discectomies can be done either open or tubular. And when you say discectomy, tell ah, us what you mean. That's when you have a disc herniation, so that joint in between the two vertebral bodies, you have a disc herniation. That disc herniates out, compresses one of the nerve roots, and then generally uh, uh, the mainstay of treatment is first you start with conservative therapy, but if you fail physical therapy and injections, then you go on to surgery. And if you go on to surgery, that surgery can be done in one of three ways. One is traditional open open, take out the bone, take out the disc. The second is minimally invasive tubular, where we go in with tubes, access the bone, drill the bone, and take out the disc. And the third is percutaneous. In my practice, I do both percutaneous and tubular, the two ways of minimally invasive. In the percutaneous way, we don't drill any bone. In the tubular way, we drill some bone. The, um, and then the, some, some people use the percutaneous with an endoscope, or you can do the tubular with a microscope. 
I think one of the most important things that you you have told us today is you mentioned the other modalities, and you want to do try all of those before you have spine surgery, even though uh, you're a spine surgeon. Uh, I understand that, but it, it is it is the thing that yep. you use to to fix the problem if everything else fails. Absolutely, the most minimally invasive surgery we can offer is no surgery at all. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's absolutely we want to we want to avoid surgery as often as we can, as best we can, every time. And so if those other uh, conservative, non-operative measures succeed, then that's perfect because then the patient can avoid surgery and that's better for everybody. Our guest is neurospine surgeon, Dr. Mohammed Biden. Uh, time for a short break. When we come back, myth or matter of fact, bed rest is the best cure for back pain. You're listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic News Network. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Our guest is neurospine surgeon. That is a neurosurgeon who does spine surgery, Dr. Mohammed Biden. Uh, we've, talking, we've been talking about minimally invasive spine surgery, a, a huge advance actually in, in spine surgery. And uh, before we talk about the benefits versus open type of procedure, we've got a myth or matter of fact. Yeah, myth or matter of fact. Bed rest is the best cure for back pain. What do you say? Um, a little bit of both. Ah, uh, <laughs> great. <laughs> so um, d back pain, the most common type of back pain is musculofascial pain, uh, as we discussed a little bit earlier. And for that kind of pain can be exacerbated by overusage. And so uh, ice, sometimes heat packs, um, resting, uh, those can be very helpful. In addition to anti-inflammatories, uh, over-the-counter anti-inflammatories, th those things can be very helpful. Well, is, is it fair to say that if your back pain is bad enough that – over-the-counter medications won't pretty much relieve the pain that you ought to go see somebody? Absolutely, and I would start with your primary care doctor. Generally, they're gonna be very well-versed in the initial uh, measures uh, uh, for that. You Really, you're gonna see a surgeon at the end of the line. First, you're gonna see your primary care doctor, then likely a physiatrist, and then, and then a surgeon at the end of that line when everything else has failed. Um, so you've talked to us about minimally invasive surgery. Uh, you haven't told us exactly what kinds of things that you can do, but tell us about the benefits. Tell us about the difference between having a, a, a discectomy, having your disc removed openly, the old type of surgery, versus minimally invasive. Yeah. So with minimally invasive surgeries, we essentially use smaller incisions that preserve the tendinous attachments uh, of the paraspinal muscles. And uh, we use those smaller incisions in order to either decompress or stabilize the spine. Um, and the benefits of it would include uh, less blood loss, less pain, um, lower uh, uh, improved length of stay. You can leave the hospital earlier, same day usually, uh, returning to work earlier, and greater patient satisfaction and lower infection rates. Those are many of the touted benefits. In addition to preserving the paraspinal muscles, the muscles that hold the spine up allow you to extend your back and do those things. So those are uh, some of the major uh, benefits of, of minimally invasive spine surgery. I have to say that the the thing that I think about when I hear that somebody's going to have back surgery, I just think in my head, don't say it out loud to them. I think, well, that's it. Because <laughs> now you have a life of back pain ahead of you. I feel like, as Dr. Shives was saying before the break, you want to do all these other things before you say, yes, let's do back surgery. Because the best that you can hope for is maybe it doesn't hurt all the time. I mean, it is there, is there back surgery that actually makes people feel as good as before that back pain started? So that's a very good question. The, we do know from some of our national studies and some of our Mayo Clinic studies that uh, patients generally who have neck surgery, cervical spine surgery, about 90% of them would have that same surgery again. And patients who have lumbar surgery, a little over 80% of them would have that same surgery again. So in a vast majority of the cases, people get better enough that they would undergo the same surgery again. Well, that does say something. Well, um, <laughs> that's true. But on the other hand, we all know that there are a fair number of back cripples out there. Yep. People who have had multiple back surgeries that were repeatedly unsuccessful, and now they're basically disabled because of their back. So there's no question. You want to avoid it if you can. But right. if you can't, I mean, I had, you remember when I had mm -hmm. neck surgery mm -hmm. how many years ago? It was unavoidable. Right. You know, my arm was starting to go weak and the muscles were going weak and, and it you worked. can't avoid it. Well, I don't know. It, it seemed to. <laughs> 
Everybody who does. There's a 99% chance that I'd have it again. I actually, I, I but agree. I, avo- I did everything I could to avoid it. I, I agree I with you completely. You, you know, the, the number one thing to do is avoid surgery if you can. I always tell patients the most minimally invasive spine surgery is no surgery at all. Yep, That's exactly. as, as least invasive as we can get. But if you have to have it, and this is where I think minimally invasive spine surgery can help, the key with minimally invasive surgery is you target that pain generator. You don't just go after every single thing on the MRI that looks like it's degenerated because then you're going after the whole back. You men- Just oh, sorry. target that specific area. You mentioned joint replacement. What do you mean by that when it comes to our spine? Uh, so people think of, and Mayo has a long history, in fact, a pioneering history of uh, joint replacements for hips, for knees, um, and throughout uh, orthopedic surgery. Um Uh, shoulders. um, For the spine, we discussed some joints in the spine. There is uh, a lot of pioneering uh, areas around disc replacement. And so one of the discs, um, one of the areas of our spine is the disc, which are the intervertebral discs between the vertebral bodies. And there's a lot of literature out there to show the safety and the effectiveness of rather than doing a fusion at that level where there's no more motion, we do a joint replacement at that level where we preserve the motion. And that, again, would be a way to reduce what we call adjacent segment disease, where people get disease at the levels above and below a spine surgery. So the more that we can preserve motion, preserve the tendinous attachments of the muscle, the better off the patients are. And those are kind of the mainstays. Um, and, and certainly around disc arthroplasty, it's been more successful in the neck than in the lumbar spine. But we have a number of uh, patients uh, who've benefited from that. So you like disc replacement. I mean, you think it's effective. Yeah, we, we have, actually, I have a person, I have a high volume of patients who've undergone disc replacement. And, and, you know, the majority of patients with disc replacement, those numbers, patients who have disc replacement actually are happier uh, than patients who uh, undergo okay, fusion I, I, surgery. I, I see. So you can then preserve motion at that level so you don't put a, get excess motion above and below. Um, but uh, what, I, what I don't understand uh, is... I forgot my question. <laughs> oh, what I don't understand is that rarely is degenerative disc disease isolated to just one disc. Right. So you're replacing one disc, but you really got disc disease up and down the spine. That's a very good question. That's why when you're choosing those patients who would benefit from a disc replacement, you need to pick those patients who have disease at one level and, and not at multiple levels. In addition, you have to pick those patients whose disease is degenerated somewhat, but not so much that they no longer have any space between their bones, because then the replacement that you put in may fuse anyway. And I would say minimally invasive techniques are also useful for spinal tumors, uh, which is another area that uh, I've uh, uh, you know that, that I practice in. Mm-hmm. And so for both degenerative disease and for people who have spinal tumors, there could be minimally invasive options. We have about 45 seconds left. You had mentioned some firsts here at Mayo Clinic. What are some of those you wanted to share? We've done the first uh, navigated percutaneous discectomy, the first navigated percutaneous. Now, tell us what you mean by navigated? Uh, uh, using uh, guidance, uh, g- sort of GPS guidance in the operating room, so to speak. Uh, the first navigated percutaneous fusion, a fusion through a seven millimeter incision. Wow. Um, the first navigated lateral lumbar uh, inner body fusions. Coming not all in sp- from the side. Coming in from the side, not all spine surgeries from the back. We can come in from the side. That has no uh, hip attachment uh, with it. And we have a number of minimally invasive lumbar laminectomies that also don't require general anesthesia. We can do them with uh, a spinal, a spinal uh, uh, injections and uh, uh, perform a minimally invasive uh, decompression. And that's a big benefit to the patient because they get to avoid general anesthesia. Yeah, not have to go to completely asleep to have right. the thing done. Exactly. Uh, unbelievable. Minimally invasive surgery with neurospine surgeon Dr. Mohamed Biden. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you very much for having me.